Um, this is the Ecology and Identification of Spring Wildflowers webinar. Uh, if you're not here for this, you uh, got to go somewhere else, I guess. A um, couple things just to get rolling um, with this. Um, just to orient it, um, everybody that's participating and listening in, we have you muted. Um, so uh, we didn't want to add a lot of confusion. We have a lot of attendees for this. So if you have questions, um, ask it via the chat function that we have. Um, we should have that option here. And um, we'll try to answer them that way. Uh, I'll try to hold answering questions till the end, just to make it, um, make it flow a little better. Uh, we are recording this presentation and we're gonna make it available on the Extension Forestry YouTube channel afterwards. And then if you're here as a master naturalist or a master gardener, this qualifies as a one hour of continuing education. Um, I'm excited about doing this. This is our one, my first Zoom webinar. So um, I, I hope it goes well. And uh, I hope it's useful information. I think the timing's right here in the spring as the wildflowers start to uh, explode across Illinois. So with that, I'll go ahead and just jump right in. Uh, outline for what I'm wanting to do today. Uh, really kind of start with a little bit of definitions of what I'm talking about uh, when I say spring wildflowers. What are some of the commonalities that you see across the board for spring wildflowers? What habitat um, they're found in? Uh, some of the ecology about them, you know, why they, why they do this? Why, why do we see them growing where they do? Some little bit about that. Uh, got to mention threats of course so I'll hit a little bit on some threats that we see to spring wildflowers and then really get into the meat of the presentation which is um, highlighting some of the common wildflowers in Illinois. Uh, putting this together this could easily have been a three-hour webinar uh, there's so many wildflowers uh, spring wildflowers in Illinois so it's hard to narrow it down so if I uh, did not put your particular favorite spring wildflower in this presentation, um, I'm sorry, but uh, you know, we had to cut it off somewhere. So I try to focus on the, the common ones. And, um, and I'm, since I'm in Southern Illinois, I'll just go ahead and say that I have a bit of a Southern Illinois bias to this, um, just because that's where my pictures are. Um, but we'll co cover, a lot of these cover the whole state and there's some that's in Northern Illinois only that I, I cover as well. Um, so again, there's, we can only cover a few of them here in, in an hour, um, but we'll try to, to hit the common ones. And then I'll, I'll end with some resources for people that are interested in learning more about um, spring wildflowers, interested in learning more about identifying them. I'll hit a few things there uh, that people can use you know, as resources. All right. So the neat thing about plants in Illinois Really, uh, they're, they're every color of the rainbow, and that's just, you know, our flowers, our wildflowers in general. Uh, it's amazing diversity across the state for uh, what you can find in our forest, and our prairies, and our uh, wetland ecosystems. And uh, it's, I'm, I'm continually blown away by the amount of diversity uh, we have in this state um, in, terms of, in terms of flowers. And now not all of these are, are spring wildflowers. And so that's a, a different group. Um, so that's what I'm focusing on today are the spring wildflowers. And, and that with that, I'm really talking about wildflowers that bloom for a very short period in very early spring. And there's a whole suite of, of species that kind of fall into that, um, that category. And so that's the group that we're focusing on today are these early spring wildflowers. You may have heard um, this term kicked around. People call them spring ephemerals. So that's another name that you'll hear mentioned a lot for, um, we're talking about these early spring wildflowers or these spring ephemerals. And that just simply means ephemeral is a term that means for a short time or temporary. And so these are wildflowers that are only out for a short time, a short period in early spring, um, and very short. Usually their above ground growth period is 40 to 60 days is what you're talking about. So they're a, a very brief period in very early spring. So that's the group that, that we're mentioning today. Uh, there's some commonalities that we see with this whole group of spring wildflowers. 
Um, most of them, again, not all, but most of them tend to be uh, insect pollinated. There's a bunch of different insects that'll pollinate them. Some are bees and some are ants, some are beetles. In general, most of them um, kind of fall into the fly pollinated or, or solitary bee pollinated. Um, because they're insect pollinated, most of these spring ephemerals tend to be very showy. And then we have big displays of flowering at one time and that's why we love them, right? We got to see the showy flowers when there's a ton of them all out at once. Um, also, most of these, uh, tend to be long-lived plants and, and slow-growing perennials. There are some examples of annuals and, and, and others, but in general, they're mostly slow-growing slow growing perennial plants. Many of them take years of growth before they'll actually even start flowering. Um, and also, uh, a big commonality among these is most of our spring ephemeral wildflowers actually are very shade intolerant plants. So they need a lot of high light. Um, they have a high light requirement. And that's very important when we get into ecology. Um, that's a major component of this. And we'll talk a lot more about that. Um, and it's kind of interesting having uh, plants in the understory of a forest that are shade intolerant with real high light requirements. But just this, this idea of having these very showy flowers and big displays, um, we see these. And, and this is, again, why we love these plants. And, and I'll try to mention the, the idea of plants when I have them up on the screen. Uh, this is dwarf larkspur here. And you can see just a, a massive flowering display and, and um, really just kind of takes your breath away out there. And we find these sometimes where there's just huge groups. And this is fringed facilia here, um, just a massive hillside covered in it and um, just big displays of wildflowers again you know these they kind of most of them kind of co-flower at the same time and we see a ton of plants out there in terms of habitat the, the thing about spring wildflowers is they don't really occur everywhere they're, they're kind of restricted to particular habitats this happens to be um, Virginia bluebells right here and so it's kind of predictable once you know the habitat that they're going to be mostly found in um, you can kind of identify them on the landscape of where the most likely places are going to be. And, and overall, when you're looking for um, big displays of spring wildflowers, you're going to focus on what we call rich mesic woods. And so with rich, we're talking about um, rich in nutrients. So these are sites that have high nutrient availability, deep soils. Um, mesic is a term. It's, it means basically not too wet and not too dry. Uh, there's ample moisture, but it's not standing flooded moisture. And then woods, so me rich mesic woods. Moods, woods, what I'm talking about here are forested sites, and typically uh, we're talking about deciduous forest sites. Um, these sites are very productive sites, and often they're very big trees, deep soils, and diverse understory. And then um, just kind of, you, you know you're in a, a rich mesic woods because that's where all the spring wildflowers are. So you can you can identify these sites even not even in spring. You know you're looking for those big trees, um, moist, um, rich soil, um, heavy leaf layer, those kind of things. What you're looking for, lots of organic matter in these areas. Um, and that's where you'll find a lot of wildflowers. Now some of these spring wildflowers have broader um, habitat requirements, so they can they can grow outside of that. But if you're looking for those big displays where there's a ton of wildflowers you're gonna look for those, um, those rich music woods, those, those particular sites. Um, just a little bit more on the kind of habitat you're looking for here. Um, these are forested sites, again, relatively deep, well-developed soils, very rich in nutrients. Usually they're neutral or slightly basic uh, pH to the soils. And then these aren't the, the upland oak hickory forests that we have so much in Illinois. These are, um, really closed canopy sites with deciduous mesophytic species. And so with that, you're looking at things like tulip tree, ash, sugar maple, beech, red oak at times, basswood. Some of these more mesic species that like a little moisture, um, don't, the sites that don't really burn as well, you know, more developed leaf litter. Um, oftentimes, um, if you do have a shrub layer present in um, these rich mesic woods where you see a lot of wildflowers, you're gonna have species like pawpaw, bladder nut, and spice bush kind of as your, your shrub layer. And um, for me especially, it's, it, I've seen the most rich sites, the highest wild, wildflower diversity, uh, at least in Southern Illinois, in sites that have a lot of bladder nut. 
to me, that's the one species that if I see a, a lot of bladder nut, um, the shrub out on the landscape, um, that's kind of a good indicator that that's a, a pretty high quality site, a pretty nutrient rich site, and one that may have a lot of spring wildflowers for sure. So, you know, these sites, again, very productive sites, often have very big trees. I'm a forester, so I'm uh, naturally just kind of by law have to take pictures uh, of me standing beside big trees. So when I see a big tree, I take a picture of it. But these are, you know, really productive sites, right? You have lots of um, deep soils. So you get big trees, um, uh, sites on these, uh, lots of vegetation. Um, areas where you'll have beach, like on this shot here, some different species like that is kind of what you're looking for. Cove sites, very productive sites, um, lots, of, lots of deep soils on these. And then again, if you find those, those shrubs, pawpaw, um, bladder nut, spice bush, that's a good indication that you're, you're in the right habitat. And the nice thing about those, um, especially, you know, this is pawpaw right here, is that they also are very showy and they, they flower in the spring, which is kind of nice. And then bladder nut, of course. Looking at the, the landscape position, kind of where do you where do where would you find um, rich woods out on the landscape? These are often not kind of spread everywhere, and you won't find big, huge areas across the landscape. They're more often small pockets uh, within a greater matrix of, of other kind of more upland hardwood forest. And usually, you find these rich woods in the most diversity in what we call colluvial situations. So you may be familiar with um, the term alluvium or alluvial, which means that's material getting brought in with floodwaters. So an alluvial floodplain is one that gets a lot of, um, you know, silt deposits or sand deposits uh, during every flood, right? That's alluvial. Colluvial is um, accumulation of matter from downslope movement, is what that means. And really what you're looking at there is um, it's a site where in the, the upland, so maybe a shoulder uh, of a slope or the side slope, those are areas where water moves through and it's going to erode. And so you're losing nutrients, you're losing organic matter out of those upland sites. A colluvial situation or colluvial site is one that's accumulating those nutrients after they uh, erode and move from the upland systems. And so it's kind of that downslope movement of organic matter or fine material where it collects. And so you'll find colluvial sites, uh, toe slopes, so at the bottom of slopes where it starts to flatten out, bases of ledges, talus slopes, and of course talus is just kind of loose rock that's fallen out of, of bluffs or, or um, slopes. Cove sites, um, some ravines, it's areas that accumulate uh, material as it, as it moves down from the uplands. And that just basically adds and it it gets a constant kind of influx of nutrients. Um, we're looking for sites that are moderate to well-drained, so they don't have um, standing water present or experience frequent inundations that so you're not really, really wet. It gets plenty of moisture, but uh, the moisture moves through, and so you're not getting ponding or standing water. And often it's north or east facing, but you know, really not always. It can be kind of any aspect. It's just in general, north and east facing are a little cooler. Um, sites and so you tend to find um, the really rich music woods kind of in on those those aspects. And so toe slopes, bottom of slopes like you see here, this happens to be um, blue-eyed Mary's um, is kind of where you'll find some accumulation um, at the base of a base of slopes or base of hills or small um, ravines or small coves. This is Virginia bluebells again. Um, you're looking for those kind of landscape positions. This is the, the bottom of a slope. We're still part of a slope here, but we're, we're out of the shoulder and then kind of where it's just starting to flatten out the bottom of a slope and where that kind of holds those nutrients in there. And this is um, celandine poppy here with a lot of fragile fern growing. So that's kind of the site you're looking for, the, um, the landscape position when you're wanting to find a lot of um, spring wildflower displays, you're looking for those rich music woods in those toe slopes or, or cove sites. Just moving into the ecology of um, spring wildflowers. Um, this of course is, um, you know, showy lady slipper here but there's a lot of different spring wildflowers and there's some, some overall commonalities with those and then some things that we see kind of cropping up again that makes them kind of a special group of plants. 
before I get into that, I definitely want to highlight some uh, some good references. If you're interested in digging more into uh, the ecology and the uh, just the natural history of, of spring wildflowers. Here are some good um, scientific literature um, articles. So LaPointe in 2001 really talked about phenology and the timing of spring wildflowers and how that influences um, when they come out, if their physiology, how they're, they're developed. Some really good information kind of about the biology behind spring wildflowers. Shelton in 2014 talked about white-tailed deer feeding and mycorrhizae fungi. Talked about a lot of plants, but has a good section on spring wildflowers and particularly how white-tailed deer foraging and, and um, mycorrhizal fungi kind of play an important role on spring wildflowers. Augsburger and Salk in 2017, um, really I, I got some good information from that article because it talked a lot about the challenges of, of cold environments and shade um, that the spring wildflowers have to deal with. And, um, and kind of how they go about dealing with those. So it's really good information. And then of course, Shimsky in 1978, really is a great article starting on some of the ecology of the spring flowering, um, the spring wildflowers. So again, feel free to dig into those, really good information there um, if you want to. Another really good resource uh, is the In Defense of Plants website. So if you haven't seen that uh, website, I really recommend checking it out if you're, if you're a plant nerd like me and want to get more information. Um, it's a, it has a ton of information about plants and it's, it's done in a very approachable way. And so it's, it's good write-ups that kind of give good basic information and delve into these different kind of ecological aspects of, of plants in general. Uh, if you go on there and just type in spring ephemeral, there's a ton of videos and little articles kind of about the ecology of spring wildflowers, really, really good information. So it's a really well done site. I would highly recommend it for anybody that's interested in kind of learning more about um, plants in general, and in this case, spring wildflowers. All right, so after the resources, let's kind of get into this ecology. What makes spring wildflowers different than any other group of, of plants? And really, um, it comes to me, it comes down to the point that they're blooming much earlier, they're, they're growing earlier um, than really any other uh, the group of plants out there, and that's kind of special. And the question comes up, well, why do they bloom earlier? And really, it's, it's due to that they need access to light that is otherwise in these habitats unavailable. So if you see the picture on the left, that's an early spring uh, shot of a, of a deciduous kind of rich woods um, here in southern Illinois. And you can see there's a lot of light hitting the floor, right? The leaves are not uh, out yet much on the trees. Uh, there's a lot of infiltration through an otherwise closed canopy and you get a highlight environment. If you look back in those same kind of habitats later in the year after the trees are fully leaved out, like the picture on the right, you're looking at a whole lot of shade in there. So suddenly the light availability has changed drastically depending on uh, the timing of the year that you look at these sites. And so we mentioned earlier that a commonality with these spring wildflowers is that they're shade intolerant. They need high light environments to be able to, um, to grow. So they bloom early to take advantage of high light environments in a system that otherwise would be a closed canopy system that's very heavily shaded. So that's kind of why they are early spring, spring bloomers. Um, but there's a lot of challenges to blooming so early in the spring. And in particular, this kind of early phenology, this early bloom time, uh, there's what I, I pulled out three major challenges to that. One is a short time window. So by the time that it actually gets warm enough to, for things to start growing, um, it's not very long in the spring until those leaves start coming out in the trees. So there's a very short time window for these plants to take advantage of high light. Uh, this short time window falls at a time when there's pretty still cold soil temperatures. And cold soil temperatures provides a lot of challenges for plants to grow. One, it's more difficult to uptake nutrients in those environments. Um, things, the water is a little harder for plants to grow. The water availability is a little less with the plants uh, that they don't, the roots don't work as well that way. There's a lot of challenges to trying to grow in, in cold soil temperatures. And then the, the third challenge is that these are um, insect pollinated plants at a time 
uh, of the year that insects and the pollinators are very are a lot less active. And so that's another challenge to them. So how do these plants kind of overcome these challenges and still do what they do at a time when there's, um, you know, there's high light? Well, let's kind of talk about some of that and particularly the st start with this short time window. Again, there's a very short period of time that there's high light environment for these plants to, um, to take advantage of. So how do they do it? And it kind of uh, starts kind of to address this if you look at their, their actual kind of growth throughout the year. And, and let's start in the middle with this, what we call epigeus phase, which is their above ground growth phase. That's what we see the plants. That's what we recognize as the plants actively growing. So for these spring wildflowers, that happens in early spring. They're blooming, they're growing, they're photosynthesizing. Um, as late spring comes around, that the trees canopy over, these plants start shutting down right then. And then in summer, they really grow completely dormant. So they actually lose a lot of their fine root hairs. Um, they lose their above ground growing portions. And then in the summer, they're persisting kind of as a starchy perennial organ, so a bulb or something like that. They're sitting in the soil kind of dormant at that time and not doing anything but just storing that energy and holding it there. Um, what they do do is by uh, in the fall, late fall, they go into what's called a hypogeus phase, which is a below ground um, growth phase. So these plants in the fall will start um, growing their fine root hairs start developing the buds for growth in the next year and kind of priming themselves throughout the winter to get ready to grow. And we've seen this that a lot of times in, in kind of real late fall or early winter, if we have one of those warm ups where we get a week or something of a very warm temperature that's a little out of place, you'll actually see a lot of the um, spring wildflowers start to put on vegetative growth in the fall. And that's because they've already started this hypogeus um, below ground growth. And what that does basically is um, it kind of primes them. It gets them ready to grow. It gets them um, ready to take up nutrients, ready to photosynthesize, ready to put on vegetative growth um, as, soon as, the, um, as soon as the temperatures allow and, uh, in the spring. So by growing in the fall and kind of taking that below ground growth in the fall, it gets them primed to, to maximize that short time window that they have in the spring to grow. And, it helps them that they do this um, with a very high photosynthetic rate so and a very efficient absorption of water. They don't have to grow a lot of roots, so they put on some fine roots and those small amount of fine roots um, are just very efficient at absorbing water. The, the, um, their foliage is very efficient at uh, photosynthesizing and taking up um, nutrients, so they don't have to grow as much roots or as many leaves to photosynthesize as other plants because they're so efficient at it. And so we'll see that with these plants is that kind of just as soon as um, things come out in the spring, as soon as the temperature warms up, these plants are all put on growth really, really fast, right? They'll, they'll, um, they'll put on a quick vegetative, vegetative growth, they'll put, develop their flowers and start blooming um, kind of in a real short uh, manner of time. And that, that helps um, the kind of helping to realize that will help you plan to view spring wildflowers. And one of the things that I, I tell people to do kind of uh, that they should do if they really want to appreciate wildflowers is they find a site that has a lot of spring wildflowers, they should visit that site multiple times throughout the spring. Um, maybe go once a week or once every two weeks because these uh, spring wildflowers develop so quick and, and grow so quick and they, they kind of move through their phases that if you go back week after week or especially every two weeks, that site looks completely different. You'll have completely different suites of wildflowers blooming. Um, it'll, it almost won't look like the same site sometimes because um, you'll have a whole new group of plants move in and, and start blooming that you didn't even notice a couple weeks before. So really to appreciate a real high quality spring wildflower site, multiple visits in the spring, and you can really then kind of really get a sense of the true diversity of the site and then see all of these wildflowers. Um, the, one of the other challenges we mentioned was cold soil temperature. How do they uh, take up nutrients and take up water and things uh, with this really cold soil temperature? And one of the ways they do that, and it um, really helps them a lot, is this. They have a strong relationship with mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. 
and the fun the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil as i'm sure you all know associates with a lot of plants and they they can basically help with nutrient uptake by changing the nutrients into a, a more an easier uptake in form and so what we find is while not all spring wildflowers do that many many have a almost an obligate relationship with this mycorrhizal fungi and they need to um they need this association, it helps them take up nutrients and so they can take up nutrients even in cold soil temperatures where the efficiency may be a little lower. The other thing uh, they get by with this is that they restrict themselves to very high nutrient availability sites. That's why we find them in rich woods. It's because they can take up nutrients at a time uh, when cold soil temperatures are out there and they're a little less efficient at taking them up. Um, so that kind of restricts them to this, the areas where there's the most available nutrients. And the other thing they do uh, is reabsorb nutrients um, very efficiently from their leaves back into their kind of perennial organs, so their bulbs uh, and roots, kind of as they senesce in late spring. And so while they use a lot of nutrients, they're really good at keeping those in their systems, reabsorbing them, and so their nutrient um, needs year to year are kind of met by their storages uh, a lot of ways instead of I'm having to take up new, new nutrients every year. So there's different ways to kind of overcome this issue of um, cold soil temperature. And then lastly, the, the last challenge is, you know, pollinators being less active. Um, how they come about that? Well, overall, most of these spring wildflowers actually have a very low pollination rate. So a lot of times uh, they're flowering, but not many of those flowers are gonna end up having um, fertile fruit, producing fertile fruit. And so they get by with that by being very long lived, very slow growing plants. And so they don't necessarily need to reproduce um, every year, don't need to produce a ton of fruit and, and produce new organisms every year because they're gonna grow a long time, they're gonna live a long time. As I mentioned a couple of times, they, they persist through these starchy perennial organs, bulbs or rhizomes, and that helps them kind of live a long time and, and, and go that way. The other thing that happens with wildflowers is that um, they do a lot of asexual propagation. So they spread um, without needing pollination or fruit production. And that's really common among a lot of these wildflowers, whether they're spreading through bulblets or stolons or rhizomes, there's different ways for them to um, spread without pollination, without, um, without fertilizing um, fruit. They can spread asexually through this. Interestingly enough, uh, through the reading, is that a lot of times these rhizomes, when they develop new plants, instead of staying connected, they often sever those connections um, after the new plants are developed. So they kind of spread, but they don't keep those connections. And then just the other day, I was out in the woods in an area where we had a, a lot of rain and kind of sheet flow, and it, it moved some of the, um, the leaves out, and you could actually see some of this. And so this is a shot here of water leaf and you can see the some of the top soil and some of the leaves were washed away and you can kind of see the rhizomes and how all these different water leaf plants um, are connected underground. So I thought that was really fascinating to see that and, and, and kind of get a firsthand experience of kind of how these plants will spread without the need of pollination. And what happens with this is you get to see then these sites where you have a big clusters of the same species, um, probably due to asexual reproduction uh, this happens to be yellow trout lily, uh, white trillium, just big groups of the same species, um, dwarf larkspur here that are growing and some of it may be through fruit but a lot of that's through asexual reproduction and them just kind of spreading slowly over a site. Now there are some threats to these spring wildflowers. Um, because they're slow growing, because they need mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, um, plant poaching is a big threat to them. A lot of times you dig these plants up and try to move them. They're not gonna, um, may not survive that movement. Um, also, they're gonna be a little slower to recover if you do dig some plants out of there. So that is a major threat to these, particularly the more showy ones. Um, excessive deer browse is an issue, again, because they're slow growing. Um, too, much, too many deer in an area, overpopulation of deer is just hard on these um, spring wildflower populations and it, they have a hard time recovering. Um, and then invasive plants, of course. Um, in particular, there's two of our um, big invaders in Illinois that are particularly damaging to spring wildflowers. The first is pictured here is garlic mustard. So if you know garlic mustard, it's a, it's a 
invasive plant that grows in the early spring, about the same time as a lot of our spring wildflowers. Uh, but unlike our spring wildflowers, um, garlic mustard doesn't really need to associate with mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. So what we found is that it actually has the ability to exude chemicals out of its roots that act almost as a fungicide and inhibit the growth of these spring wildflowers, it's inhibit the growth of the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. And so plants that require that association have a harder time taking up nutrients and it gives garlic mustard a, a competitive edge. And so it's particularly damaging, I think, to these groups above um, plants that really need mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. So I think it's particularly damaging to our spring wildflowers. And the other one is um, bush honeysuckle. Bush honeysuckle, as you all may know, uh, has a extended leaf phenology compared to our, our native shrubs. And so it's gonna leaf out and start growing two and a half, three weeks earlier than our native shrubs. And then it's gonna stay green later as well. But um, we just mentioned there's a very short time window for these uh, spring wildflowers to, to, to grow in the spring. And if half of that window is cut off now because um, the honeysuckle leafs out earlier than our natives, um, it's just gonna provide that shade and not give those plants enough sunlight to grow. And this was really evident the other day when I was hiking, uh, I was in a site that had a lot of um, bladder nut and a lot of pawpaw and a lot of, of spice bush actually, and tons of spring wildflowers. And all the wildflowers are going, they were rolling, they were beautiful. And um, all these native shrubs were growing, they were starting to bloom, but there wasn't any leaves on them yet. And so there was still plenty of light reaching the ground floor, except for, um, the one big bush honeysuckle bush that was growing in the middle of all these native shrubs and it was fully leafed out and it was dark underneath of it. It was a very, very stark difference um, between the natives and the invasives and how much light they're allowing uh, into the soil at, at this time period, at this time of year. And so th those are threats to, um, to our spring wildflowers. Um, had to mention them here. Uh, there's also some benefits to the ecosystem of these spring wildflowers. They provide early floral resources at a time when not a lot else is blooming, early browse, early forage at a time as well. And then interestingly enough, they, uh, there's some work out there showing that they, they kind of um, hold the nutrients in these systems during a rainy period. And what I mean there is in the spring, um, you get a lot of rains, it may actually move some of the nutrients even out of these um, rich wood sites. But by having a, a suite of species that are already putting their roots in the ground, already taking up nutrients, it kind of keeps those nutrients in the system when otherwise they may have been washed out or they may have moved through that system. So it helps enrich the soils in these areas, which then can be used for, by the other plants um, um, throughout the year. And so I think that's a neat benefit to these plants. All righty. So now I guess we're at the main event. The things that uh, you probably came to hear is um, some of these spring wildflowers. And so when I put this together, again, I couldn't mention a lot of them. So I just wanted to highlight the common ones. And I arranged them in order of rough order of bloom time. So the first ones I'm going to mention are the ones that you'll find first in the spring blooming. And then as we go through the list, we're getting later and later in the spring. So the last ones I mentioned are kind of the late bloomers in the spring, roughly. All right, so the first you've got to start with then is Harbinger of Spring. So Harbinger of Spring uh, for much of Illinois is our first spring wildflower that comes out here in far Southern Illinois. This thing sometimes blooms in late January. Um, Northern Illinois, I know you guys have things like skunk cabbage and, and snow trillium as well that kind of serve those early spring roles. But Harbinger of Spring, um, beautiful little plant, tiny little flowers. It's very, it's only a couple inches high. And a lot of times it'll bloom. Um, the flowers will come out even before you see um, these kind of fern-like leaves coming out. And so early, early in the spring, you'll see just these small little um, flowers popping up like this. Another really early one is bloodroot. And so bloodroot is one of my favorite flowers and I think it's probably the most photogenic or one of the most photogenic uh, spring wildflowers. It's hard to see a bloodroot in bloom and not want to take a picture of it. They're just beautiful. They have a ton of petals it, uh, on them. Uh, the bright yellow anthers there really are showy. Oftentimes they'll flower just right before they start, um, they start leafing out. 
And so you'll get these beautiful flowers in here. The leaves are really unique looking. Of course, it gets its name bloodroot if you dig it up or you break the stem. Um, it'll, the sap inside of that will be this kind of dark red color, so they get the name bloodroot. Um, but just a gorgeous plant. Um, another very early one are the hepaticas. And so sharp, sharp lobe hepatica is one that we'll find around quite a bit. Uh, this one actually varies in color. It can be all the way from white to almost um, dark purple. Usually it's kind of somewhere tinged pinky, light purple, but I've seen very, uh, very differences even from one plant to the next right beside each other. Um, so really a neat plant. And then it has that really strange kind of three lobed leaf. And this is the sharp lobed one. So the lobes are pointed. They do have a round lobed one too, where the, each lobe is, is more rounded. But again, just a gorgeous, very early spring wildflower. Another one we find early in the spring uh, is toothwort. And so toothwort is one of our mustards. And of course, as uh, mustards are, they'll have four petals. Um, this one is cut leaf toothwort. You can see the very serrated leaves like that. Um, it actually has a bit of a broader habitat um, availability than, than a lot of these others. So you'll find this in the uplands as well. Um, you'll find it kind of further spread throughout than you'll find some of these wildflowers. But again, very early in the spring, um, you'll find this one growing around. And just a gorgeous plant, right? Just beautiful, um, delicate wildflower. Um, it'll get these little seed pods called salix a little later in the year after it's done blooming. But nice, those cut leaves, those serrated leaves are um, really diagnostic for this one. And then probably our one, I would say one of our most common spring wildflowers that you'll find and also one that grows kind of all over the place and has a, a not restricted to rich mesic woods are spring beauties. Spring beauties are found everywhere. Um, they're really, really a beautiful, delicate spring wildflower, blooms really early. Interestingly enough, um, where I grew up, and I grew up in the Southern Appalachians, um, we didn't call this plant spring beauty. It was found everywhere, but everybody called it chicken toe. And so I didn't even know it was called spring beauty until um, much later in life because everybody saw it, they called it chicken toe or tangle gut was the two common names over there. I had no idea why it was called either one of those, but um, it was. The spring beauty, uh, another one that varies in color. So I've seen them pure, almost pure white, the petals to um, very, very almost red. Most of the time you'll see some pink streaking like in uh, the one on the left here but it has these long thin leaves. And so when it's not blooming, a lot of times people mistake this. They think it's a grass or they don't know what it is because they don't recognize those kind of long thin leaves on the plant. Um, when it's flowering, it's really unmistakable. That, that flower with the little pink veins in the petals are, are unique. Uh, another early one is Corydalis. It's called Fumewort here, but I think Fumewort is an ugly name, so I just call it Corydalis. It's specific epithet, and there's several different um, species. This tends to be the more common one. Is kind of the pale, the pale yellow Corydalis. Um, but kind of beautiful and unusual looking uh, flower on it. Kind of fern, feathery leaves. It's not a very big plant and it never gets, you have big patches of it, but it's never really, really dense. So it's usually kind of interspersed with a lot of other um, wildflowers in there, but pretty early bloomer. Um, and that kind of pale yellow coloration adds a little color in the early spring when most of our, our spring wildflowers very early are white. So it's, it makes a nice, nice addition. Another one you'll find around is false rue anemone. And so this is a, an interesting plant that does form big patches. And so oftentimes you don't just find one of these, you'll find big clusters of them, very dense foliage growing. So it's very, uh, has a ton of kind of asexual growth on this one. Interesting enough, it's, it's scientific name, uh, the specific epithet, bitternatum means twice in threes. So if you look at the flowers, uh, sorry, the leaves, like the leaf on the center here, it's a three parted, it's a, three parted leaf right yet one two three leaflets and each leaflet has three lobes so it's twice in threes right so it's three lobed and three leaflets um, on it so it's really an unusual plant that way with those um, biternate I guess you would call it leaves but really delicate white flowers um, it's a one that produces a ton of flowers on it 
And then again, just a ton of foliage. And so you'll find these big clusters and it kind of serves as a ground cover in some areas where you'll find a ton of that uh, vegetation in there and just a lot of it flowering. So it's really one of our nice, beautiful ones in the spring. Uh, moving on, one of my favorites is Dutchman's Britches. And so that's a, again, a very beautiful plant. Uh, when it's in full flower, you'll see these little, looks like little white uh, pants that hanging out on a line um, where it gets its name's Dutchman's Britches from. Just a, a unique looking, beautiful plant. Um, a close cousin of it is squirrel corn. So a lot of people get these plants mistaken for each other, but they are a little different as the Dutchman's Britches had the pants. This looks like a little kernel of corn or a little heart growing on the squirrel corn. Other than that, if they're not flowering, they're really, really hard to tell apart. Um, I do I have found that squirrel corn blooms, starts blooming a couple weeks later than, um, than Dutchman's Britches in the sites that I've seen them growing together. And the nice thing is they do grow together. Here's a picture of squirrel corn in the front and Dutchman's Britches in the background. So you'll find them growing right next to each other. And again, if they're not blooming, I can't really tell them apart. But when they are blooming, you just look at, uh, they're pretty easy to tell apart if you look at the top of the flowers. Um, another early spring wildflower, one that I really like is golden seal. So golden seal is a really good indicator of a high quality site. So if you have a lot of golden seal, you know that you're in a site that's pretty intact. And just, it has just an unusual flower. Um, once uh, the flowers ripen into a fruit, it'll be this dark red little fruit that'll sit nestled into the leaf. And even so even later in the year, it's a beautiful plant. And then our trout lilies. Trout lilies also called dog tooth violets. Uh, they call them trout lily because the leaves kind of look like a speckled trout. Um, that's the, what I've heard. And there's two different kinds of trout lilies. There's several kinds, but two major common kinds that you'll find around is one is the yellow trout lily. Um, and then the other is the white trout lily, which I'll mention next, but just delicate, beautiful flowers. And this is one that you'll see a ton of plants that um, just have the leaves and not flower. So a lot of times you'll see whole hillsides of just the, the leaves growing and uh, you won't see any of them flowering. And then other times in, in areas, you'll see a ton of flowering. So it's really interesting that way. Um, the white one, to me seems to grow a little bit better in lower wetter sites and I usually don't see them together. Usually it's either one or the other and I very rarely see them intermixed with each other. Um, but both are beautiful, both have very similar foliage, um, just one's white and one's predominantly yellow but really some of our be most beautiful wildflowers I think. Um, the next one is a little different in terms of its ecology, blue-eyed Marys. They like more floodplain habitats. I think they're an annual, they grow a little faster. So they don't really fit exactly the same mold as a lot of our other spring wildflowers because they like a little bit more flooding. They can handle a little more water. Um, they spread a little faster, but they do form these big patches of it. And so um, they're really beautiful to see in these kind of floodplain forests sometimes or you'll have acres and acres that are just solid blue and beautiful. Kind of a neat looking flower, white on top, uh, petals and then blue petals on the bottom. Really um, a neat looking plant. Uh, another one is Jacob's Ladder and I wanted to show the the foliage first before I get into the flowers because why they call it Jacob's Ladder, the leaves kind of look like a ladder, a little going up. That's why I believe they call it Jacob's Ladder. Um, this one, you know, has that ladder-like leaves and has the beautiful delicate light blue flowers, kind of the pink center. Um, really beautiful. There is a, a plant that can be mistaken for Jacob's Ladder. They look a lot alike and that's our Fernleaf Facilia. And so a lot of times I see people mistaking these two plants um, for each other. So, but if you look at them, there's, there's an easier way to tell them apart. So the, the Fernleaf Facilia doesn't really have that yellow center to its leaves, its flowers. The flowers are a little bit more purplish, but especially look at the leaves. So on the Jacob's Ladder, it looked like a ladder. We had those uh, kind of pinnate leaves that came out that were kind of entire. They didn't have any serrations. If you look at the leaves on um, Fernley Facilia, they're kind of dissected a little more. They're a little cut up on them. And that, um, that, that kind of cut look or that dissected look is a little different than Jacob's Ladder. And so I think they look different. And as well as the, the different, slightly different coloration to the flower and that lacking of a, a yellow center. 
Um, but again, both of these grow, you see them right next to each other and they get mistaken for each other quite a bit. Um, we have a several trilliums in Illinois. Uh, I'm gonna highlight three of the more common ones. So red trillium or prairie, prairie trillium is probably our most common trillium. You'll find it all over the place. Um, there's some other red flowering trilliums, but this one's easy to identify by the, um, the bracts that are below the flowers. You can see here, they're kind of strongly down curved or recurved. That's where it gets its name, recurvatum. But they kind of, those bracts point down back to the ground on uh, red trillium. Oops, wrong way. You can see sometimes the, they're dark red, sometimes they're more light and faint red, but they always have that, um, that recurved bract, that kind of green bract that sticks back down towards the ground, and that'll get you to, to our red trillium. One of our most showy trilliums is our white trillium, trillium flexipes. You can see it's a big plant, really tall, really big flowers, um, showy because it's so bright white, really, really nice looking plant. For this one, you want to look at um, the uh, the anthers in the flower. So they're white colored and see how they're curved. So they curve back away. That's a good characteristic of white trillium, um, especially if you look at the other big white flowering trillium we have, which is called large flower trillium. This one doesn't really occur in Southern Illinois. This is gonna be a Northern Illinois plant. It's another big um, plant that has a flower up on a stalk with white petals. So you could get them mixed up, but if you remember the white trillium we saw first, had those white, you know, anthers that had that curved. This one, if you look at them, they're yellow and straight on the center of the plant there. So that's the big difference. This one also tends to have wavy edges to the petals. All that's a little bit variable um, depending on the individual plant. Um, but that's the best way to tell them apart is the coloration there in the center of it and then whether they're straight or curved. Probably what I think is our showiest spring wild, one of our showiest spring wildflowers is our celandine poppies. And so they are just gorgeous, um, very like um, delicate, delicate flowers, almost papery, um, tissue papery on in there, but really unusual leaves. Even the flower buds being all fuzzy look neat. So this is a plant that's really a beautiful plant. Um, uh, big displays of this are, are like nothing else that you'll find out there. Kind of getting into later into the spring, things like dwarf larkspur, which we mentioned a couple times here, that dark purple color is really like nothing else. If you look close to them, they have those spurs out the back of the flowers, uh, all the flowers on a little spike like this. Really, really a neat, um, a neat plant altogether. Um, we have a couple phloxes. Um, two I want to mention, one is cleft phlox. So this is one that can grow in the uplands as well and even on some dry sites. If it's not flowering, a lot of people mistake this one because it has kind of almost grass-like leaves as well. But when it is flowering, you're looking at the, the petals have that deep cleft in the end of the petals. Um, like all phloxes, they're five petaled. This ranges from white all the way to kind of dark blue in color. But you're looking for those deep clefts at the end of the petals will get you to cleft phlox. Uh, another common phlox is our common woodland phlox. This grows in, in kind of more moist sites, um, has a bit variable coloration as well, but it's just an overall bigger plant, um, bigger leaves, and kind of more tall than you'll see with uh, uh, the cleft phlox. And then later in the year, later in the spring, we have several other phloxes bloom. But this tends to be the common one you'll find in our spring and our, our wildflower sites. Um, just a couple more here. Um, wild geranium is also probably our, one of our showiest spring wildflowers and also one of our most photogenic. Um, they have big displays. It's a tall flower. I've seen it sometimes up to two feet tall, a tall plant overall, and just gorgeous um, flowers on this plant. This is one that's hard not to take a picture of every time you see it as well. Um, but those big, you know, traditional geranium style leaves like you see in the picture on the right and the big pink uh, flowers that are pretty big um, will get you to wild geranium. It's really like nothing else. And then just a couple more kind of late spring wildflowers. Uh, red columbine is just an unusual plant, really beautiful. This one will grow in spring uh, wildflower sites, but also can grow in upland sites. You can see it growing right out of uh, 
cliffs and rocks, so it's got kind of a wide growth range. But just that dark red coloration uh, makes it stand aside in that unusual arrangement of its flowers. And then bluebells. Bluebells are one of our biggest ones for showing just like big seas of, of color. Um, unusual coloration to their, their flowers. They'll start out kind of pink or purple and as they flower they'll turn that blue color. They often hang down like bells which is where they get their names. Just gorgeous uh, wildflower. Again more of a late spring blooming wildflower. And then the last one just to mention are may apples. May apples are a wild plant. Um, they grow in the uplands as well. In the bottomlands, they kind of find them all over the place. They're tall and they kind of bloom later in the spring, but you'll see them growing right now. And as they come out of the ground, they kind of come out like a spiral and they're really unusual and, and neat even before when they just start coming out of the ground. But if you look below those big umbrella-like leaves, you can find some really beautiful flowers on them as well. So they're kind of neat out there. And again, there's a ton of different spring wildflowers out there. I just wanted to hit a few of them here, and then I'll end my talk with some resources. Um, there's some neat resources out there if you want to get out and look at plants. There's some apps that can help you identify wildflowers. The first three there, iNaturalist, Seek, and PlantNet, are ones that you can actually take pictures of a plant or point your camera at a plant, and it'll, it'll give you a, a, a guess as to what the plant, the idea of the plant is, and they're usually pretty good. Um, so if you look at them, you know, I, here's an example, it says, congratulations, you observed sweet gum. So I just basically pointed my, my camera and my phone at a sweet gum ball and it identified it. Or you can go over on the one on the right and take a picture and upload it in there. And so they're good ways to kind of check yourself and, and if you've got, um, you know, access and reception, you can kind of get instant identification on some plants. It does pretty well. You just can't rely on it solely, but it's a good way to kind of help you out if you're out there. Uh, the Illinois Wildflower app is a little different. Instead, what it does is it has a series of choices. So you can choose what kind of plant it is, what color of flower it is, how many petals, and its leaf arrangement. And as you do that, it narrows down your list of options. And then once you kind of get down to the end, um, you can scroll through the options that are narrowed down and, and see one that looks like your plant. It's kind of a nice uh, one. You, you can download it on your phone so it doesn't take data, which is pretty nice as well. Uh, there are some books out there. Illinois Wildflowers is a great one. Uh, Vascular Floor of Illinois if you're into the technical things. And then I put the Wildflowers of Tennessee on here. And it sounds kind of funny since we're in Illinois and I'm talking about Wildflowers of Tennessee. But that book also covers um, the Ohio River Valley. So for the southern third of the state, um, it's within that book's kind of range of coverage. And it actually does a really good job. And I like the way that book's uh, laid out. And it covers um, many, many flowers, um, different plants for it. So I, I, I recommend that book, particularly if you're in the southern half of the state or southern third of the state. It's a pretty good field book to have. And then just lastly, there's a couple um, good websites out there. IllinoisWildflowers.info is a great website just to find information about a lot of plants. Uh, MissouriPlants.com is another really good one that has tons of good information. And then if you're really interested and excited about wildflowers and learning more about plants, getting involved with the Native Plant Society um, is a really good um, uh, recommendation. They have a lot of guided hikes. There's chapters all across the state. They do workshops. Um, in Southern Illinois, they've developed a couple of uh, guides to spring wildflower hikes so you can find out where to go to see the best spring wildflowers. Um, so there's a lot of uh, benefits to learning more about plants, um, to, to getting involved with the Native Plant Society. So I, I definitely recommend it. And so with that, I will um, leave you with a beautiful picture of Borks Falls, one of the nice waterfalls here in Southern Illinois. And uh, we'll take any questions. So you can use the chat function um, that's available. And if you have any questions, I'll stay on here and um, try to answer what I can. There are a few that came into the chat box already, Chris. Um, okay. Let me scroll back up here. Um, someone was asking about a copy of the slides. Will you have that available anywhere? Um, so I can. So what we're going, we're recording this. So I'll make a, this is a YouTube video available. And what I can do is make a PDF of the, of the slide handouts. And then I can send it to the, um, the, the registration list. I can do that later on today. Sure. 
Perfect. Um, wild geranium, can wild geranium become invasive? And if so, what kind of controls would you use? I, I don't think it can become invasive. I mean, it's a native plant. I've seen big patches of it, but I would not think, um, yeah, I wouldn't think it would become invasive at all. I would welcome big patches of it. Okay, excellent. Uh, question about columbine. They said, my columbine always gets a leaf miner later in the year. Uh, any way to prevent or treat it? Uh, if it's later in the year after it's done most of its photosynthesis, I would say that it's you're just providing habitat and food for insects. I wouldn't worry about it. Okay, excellent. Um, let's see here. When purchasing wildflowers from nurseries, do we need to be concerned about whether microriot fungi are present? Um, I would think so, although that's something that I don't, uh, I don't go and I don't get into the propagation of it that much. So I don't know necessarily those processes, but it's something worth looking into. Okay. Um, can you slide back to the resources, um, the app slide for resources so they can see that? Yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay, uh, question, looking to plant celadine poppy, where do you get seeds or are there other means of propagation? Uh, that's another good question. I do, do know that some native plant nurseries in the state uh, do grow it and you can get um, starts. I don't know how well it grows from seed. I don't know if there's any kind of cold stratification requirements or things, but you can find you know, seedling starts available at native plant nurseries at times. Excellent. Um, any advice on adding these ephemerals to a native plant space on a wooded property? Oh, that's a good question. Since these are slow growing and things like that, the chance of them just kind of naturally moving in, on, moving in on, their, on their own, it may be pretty slow. Um, you know, you could get rid of the invasives and hope there's some seed bank there that coming in. Or you could look at supplementing with buying some starts um, and then planting them in. It's just, you really want to kind of figure out the right locations to plant them. And I would say go to no nearby natural areas and kind of get a sense of where each of these individual plants like to grow on the landscape. So when you plant them, you have the best chance of success. Excellent. Um, question here, are shooting, st shooting stars dodecatheon, I don't know if I should pronounce that right, considered ephemeral? Um, yeah, I think so. You know, ephemeral basically means that they're there for a short period of time. And, and in Southern Illinois, we have the French's shooting star, which is very short lived in terms of that. But some of the others like Mead shooting star, uh, probably has a little bit longer of a bloom time, but I would still consider them, you know, under that, that category. Okay, excellent. Um, can too many leaves in the woods stop them from coming up? I don't, I don't think so. You know, these are, these are not like our um, upland plants that kind of are used to sites that have a lot of um, natural fire. These are sites that are in the bottomlands, in areas that, um, that are kind of more used to deeper soil or more organic matter. So I wouldn't think that too many leaves would stop them from coming up. I think they kind of know how to handle that. Excellent, excellent. Um, is Jack in the Pulpit falling into the Illinois wildflowers category? Jack in the pulpit definitely is a wildflower. It tends to bloom a little later, so it kind of falls into that late spring, early summer almost wildflower. So I wouldn't call it a spring ephemeral, but it certainly is one of our native wildflowers. Yeah, I love that. Um, okay, for wildflowers that are amongst a lawn, is summer mowing uh, detrimental to the wildflowers? I don't think so. You know, uh, these a lot of these wildflowers are going to basically finish their photosynthesis and then start um, senescing pretty early. So as long as, you know, those plants leaves are starting to die back, I think mowing them at that time is not necessarily going to hurt them. Okay, excellent. And then we had a couple comments about um, next time maybe adding the names of the wildflowers to each of the photos. I think there was some audio cutting out here and there. Oh, okay. I so should, yeah. Recording, it'll be okay. Yeah, let's hope so for that. Yeah, and sometimes that happens. Audio cuts in and out and that's, yeah. um, unfortunate but I did hopefully try to put the name on the bottom of the slide maybe sometimes that got cut off or maybe I'll make it a little more um, uh, obvious and so that they yeah. get easier seen. Hopefully if you can send out the slides that'll, that'll help that. Yes yeah definitely. 
Okay, I think I got them all, but I'm sure Chris can hang around for a little bit if you need to add any more to the chat box. So. Sure, yeah, I can stay on uh, with that. And again, I'll send out my, the, the PDF of my presentation so that way people can see it. Um, I did have the flower names on the bottom, but maybe it didn't show up on the Zoom folder as well or the Zoom screen. But I definitely thank everybody for showing up um, and um, attending this.